I want you to turn to First Thessalonians chapter number five. This is the thought that I have on my heart this evening. First Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter number five. been talking on Sunday nights, different messages along the theme of a God with no limits. Our God has no limits. We talked about dreaming dreams, seeing visions, understanding what the Bible really says about God. And so uh, tonight we're going to look in uh, 1 Thessalonians as our jumping off point and just see what the Lord would say this evening. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Uh, starting in verse number 23. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, help me to minister the word tonight. Help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us tonight. Your word comes with a promise that it does not go forth and return unto you empty, but it will accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it. So God, do your work in us tonight. We yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul says right here, I love this passage of Scripture. He tells us that our God is the God of peace. You know, sometimes I really need to be reminded about that because sometimes I get to thinking that God is, he has to be upset with me. He has to be angry. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else gets that idea or not, but I used to, especially more so when I was younger. Our God is the God of peace. There will be a day of judgment. There will be a time when he steps into that role of judge, but he's the God of peace, the God of grace, the God of mercy. And, and, and so Paul says, I pray the God of peace make you holy in every way, becoming holy, becoming Christ-like, becoming righteous in our walk is not just about us trying harder. You get that mindset, it'll get disappointing. You'll get frustrated. You'll get upset with yourself. You'll feel condemned. But when you realize the work of becoming holy is God's work in us, and yes, we have to partner with Him. Yes, we've got to... Uh, Study the Word. We've got to pray. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work. We've got to change the things that God convicts us about or illuminates to us from the pages of His Word. We have to work with the Holy Spirit, but that power and that desire to be different, to be better, to be more Christ-like, it all comes from God. And what I have found to be true in my lifetime is most people do what they really want to do. Right? If you really want to do it, most of the time, we'll make a way to do it. So God, when we yield to him, gives us the want to to become more Christ-like. And when we've got that want to of the Holy Spirit to become more Christ-like, then all we got to do is work with God, and it's a work of the Lord that, uh, you know, that, that God does. But Paul says here, you know, we might think that God's just concerned about our spirit. But he says in this passage of Scripture, these few verses, your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again and God who called you is faithful. God is faithful and he will do it, Paul says. So right there is one of the scriptures where we know that God has made us a, a three-part being. It says right there, Paul says, I pray God will keep your whole body and soul and spirit blameless. Made in three parts. We can think of it like an outer man and an inner man, and the inner man has two sides to it, two, two, uh, two parts. There's an outer man, the body, and then the inner man, the soul and the spirit. In Ephesians 3 and 14, uh, Paul says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by might, by his spirit in the inner man. In Romans 7, it says, I delight in the law of God after the inner man, but I see another law at work in my members that wars against the law of my mind, 
bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 4, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perishes, the inward, inward man is renewed day by day. Okay, Pastor, what's the point of those three scriptures? Here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says you've got a body, a soul, and a spirit. In these other places, he says you've got an outward man and an inward man. Well, the Word of God contradicting itself? No. Paul's saying there's an outward man, which is our body, our flesh. Uh, the Greek word is sarx, and it just means flesh, the, the meat and bones that make us a living corporal being. When he talks about the inner man, he's talking about our, our, our spirit, which is the eternal part of us, and then our mind or our soul, the emotional part of us, the part that makes us uniquely who we are. And so uh, now then I want you to, I, w- I want to read this verse from Hebrews 4. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So in these verses, the inner man refers to the soul and the spirit that reside within the body, while the outer man refers to the body of flesh and blood. We have a body that contains a soul and a spirit. I, I want to speak to you. I'm trying to lay a, a, a foundation uh, to, to speak to you tonight about about this topic of our heart, uh, about this thought of what really is our heart and what can God do with our heart. So uh, you have those images. You got that, the first one, that heart diagram. So Paul, the writer of Hebrews says, I tried to just create an image there to, to put into visual form what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He says, your soul is like your thoughts, the joints, and the spirit is like the marrow and the intents is what he says. The soul connects us to the carnal body or the spiritual body. The soul connects us to the carnal body and the spiritual body. You can either be spiritually minded or you can be carnally minded, but you can't be both carnally minded and spiritually minded at the same time. He says that's why the Word of God is sharp and alive and quick. It's sharp to divide between the the flesh and the spirit. It's sharp to divide uh, between the things of man and the things of God. We can be carnally minded, fleshly minded, worldly minded, or we can be spiritually minded, but you can't be both uh, at the same time it doesn't function that way flesh and spirit cannot both be in control of us at the same time because they're in opposition to one another so the soul is important to our ability to get the spirit over into the natural what do you mean by that the soul like the joints the connections the spirit it's like that marrow. What would our bone be without the marrow? Well, we'd be dead without the marrow. It's that part that generates new, uh, you know, new life in us. Our bones need the marrow to, to uh, keep life going in our body. And when cancer or whatever attacks the bone marrow, it's fatal. And so we need that marrow. It's the life within us the joints are necessary to keep us all together right if we didn't have joints <laughs> we we wouldn't be able to move or function or do the things that we need to do so what do you what are you saying well if we didn't have thoughts if things didn't start in our thoughts we'd have to you know we, we wouldn't be able to move or go or do or grow or learn or we have to have thoughts we have to have intents of our heart as well the intentions of our heart the soul we can't do we can't bring the soulish part of us the the inward man over into the physical if there's not a connection oh pastor you're not making much sense to me well let me see if i can clear it up unless our soul which you see on the screen relates to our thoughts according to the writer of hebrews unless our soul is transformed by the power of god we are, are, are always going to be human-minded, fleshly-minded, worldly-minded. What do you mean? Well, here's how Paul 
said it. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Our thoughts come from our soul or our mind, and unless it is renewed, the human side will dominate the spiritual side. Okay, what are you trying to say? Why are you doing all this teaching tonight? Well, because it is so vital for us that we don't rest on what we've already done, what we've already attained, what we've already learned. We understand that the world, this world we live in, is pumping into our lives constantly. It's pumping, you know, uh, scientists, doctors, those that study the mind, understand that even when you're asleep, your, your subconscious is still taking in input from, from the world around you. There's things that at, when we're awake, the things we watch, the people that we talk to, what we read, where we're going on the Internet, it's all feeding in to our life. It's all feeding into our life. We know that the Scripture says that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air and so much that's in the media, so much that is in, you know, what we hear through the air, what we hear, the words that come to us are as worldly-minded. It talks about do things your own way, have your own way. There's no rules. Everything's right. Do what feels good to you. There's no absolute right. There's no absolute wrong. Uh, you know, there, uh, the Bible's outdated. All kinds of things are, that are pumped into us <clears throat> daily in this world in which we live, we have got to be washed by the water of God's Word. We have got to be renewed by the cleansing of our mind through the Word of God. As we grow later and later in time, it is more and more important that God's people connect with the Word of God because the mind is what is going to control what you do, what you think, how you live your life. And if I'm going to be controlled by something, let me be controlled by the word of the living God working through the power of God's Holy Spirit and not by what any man is planning or thinks or says, certainly not by the power of the enemy. Amen. I want to be conformed to the transformed by the word of God and not conformed to what the world says. The world says it don't matter. You know, just do your own thing. Live your own life. Be your best you. You know, the world says it don't matter what it says on your birth certificate. You can be whatever you, you want to want to be. And, you know, I filled out a few questionnaires lately on some surveys and some things that I filled out. And, you know, it used to be when you would fill out something, it would say, are you male or female? And then they started adding, I prefer not to disclose or something like that. And now I had to look up some of them words because I didn't know what they meant. There's all kinds of different things that they list on there, and I'm sure they do that because people say they are whatever, you know. And there wasn't even one that just, anyway, let me just move on. There wasn't one that just said, you know, it's like, what, what gender do you relate to? This was something, well, anyway, what gender? And the words that they used, there was not male or female listed on there. There was binary and all these different, you know, Finally, I had to look one up and says, oh, well, that one's the closest to meaning I refer to the, oh, this was something that the government sent out. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, ref I relate to the birth, to the gender that was assigned to me at birth. I didn't get assigned my gender at birth. God gave me that, you know, when he created me. But what a mixed up world. I don't want to be conformed to the way the world thinks, you know. Oh, yeah, it's fine if your kid thinks he's a cat or a dog or a tree or a bush. You know, that's just fine. We can't put any limits on them. Let our minds be filled with the word of God and be bold enough to say what is right and what is wrong, not according to anything except the word of of the living God. The Bible says he created in the beginning man and woman. And let's stay with what God says. Amen. Let's be transformed by the washing of God's water of his word and let's live. So the spirit of our inner man can be thought of like the marrow according to uh, what Paul, what the writer of Hebrews says. Marrow is the part that produces the blood and is the life in the blood. It's the, the writer of Hebrews is saying that to the spirit, to the Christian, the spirit is like the marrow is to the flesh. The power of our Christian life comes to us through 
the spirit, not the soul and not the flesh. It comes through our spirit. It's our spirit that is born again by Jesus Christ when we become saved. When the Holy Spirit comes in and we are reborn, it is our spirit man that is reborn, right? We understand that. This is the Sunday night crowd. Y'all understand where I'm coming from. That is the part that connects to God. That is why even though we may be saved, we still have trouble in the soulish realm or in the uh, in the flesh realm. What do you mean? You can be saved and still be plagued on the soulish side by bad thoughts, by incorrect thoughts, by bad emotions, by, by, by unchrist-like thoughts and emotions and, and things. And we're all plagued by a flesh that knows to do right but wants to do wrong. Doesn't mean we're not saved. It just means those parts aren't really going to be changed until we get that glorified body that God is going to give us when this life is over. So what it does mean is that the spirit needs to be empowered by God to bring life to the soul, our thoughts, right, our emotions, and to bring life to our flesh, not the other way around. Our flesh will choke out our spirit. And our soul will cloud our spirit to where it's being conformed to the things of this world. Jesus said, the flesh doesn't profit you anything, but it's the spirit that quickens you, makes you alive. The flesh doesn't profit you anything. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. When we read the word of God, it doesn't change our flesh, it feeds our spirit. Amen. When we pray, it doesn't change our flesh, it feeds our spirit. When we pray in tongues, it feeds our spirit. When we worship God with worship songs and with music or, or just the words of our lips, it, it unleashes our spirit man. And when our spirit man rises up within us, then that becomes the strongest part of our being because it is equipped and empowered by God's power. What are you trying to say, preacher? I spent... I spent a long, long time trying to subdue my flesh. What do you mean? Well, just the problems of the flesh, the things that, that, that I was prone to do, you know, just the, the things of, of, of sin that were my part of my life, even though I was a Christian, and I would try, you know, like whatever, say, let's just say lying. I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to tell a lie, I'm not going to lie, God, I'm not going to lie, I promise I'm not going to lie, and then you find yourself telling a lie. Oh, it was to get me out of a hard situation. It was to not embarrass somebody. It was to, you know, but here we go again. And when you're trying to do that on your own, it leads to condemnation. You feel bad. You feel condemned. You feel unworthy. You know, maybe it's anger that you're trying to control. Maybe it's envy or jealousy or lust that you're trying to control in yourself uh you know uh, maybe it's i'm not going to watch that kind of stuff or listen to that kind of stuff anymore and then you find yourself being weak in the flesh but when we empower our spirit when we empower our spirit, the spirit that God breathed life into, the spirit that will live in eternity forever and ever and ever, when we empower that spirit through the word of God, through praying to God, through worshiping God, through spending time with God, through being in church with other believers of like precious faith, when we strengthen that spirit, man, then we find that the spirit is diminishing the power of that flesh. As the spirit grows stronger, the flesh grows weaker and weaker. Paul said, if you live after the flesh, in Romans 8, you'll die. But if you through the spirit do put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. That's, that's just what I'm trying to say to you right now. You got a problem in your flesh that you know you don't want. You don't like that. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's lack of faith. Maybe it's, uh, you know, anger or, or the propensity to gossip or whatever it might be. That if there's a problem in your life and you know, you know that you shouldn't be doing that or saying that or thinking that or whatever, but, but it just pops up. It's just there. It's, it's in your flesh. It's a besetting sin or a, a weight that, that clings on to us. The way to get the victory over that my brothers and sisters, is not to go find a self-help book at uh, Books A Million or Amazon and read a self-help book. 
It might give you some pointers. It might give you some good ideas. But the key to victory is the word of the living God that transforms our mind. Spend time in the word. Talk to the author, right? Ask the teacher, the Holy Spirit, to teach you all things. John said, when the spirit of truth has come, he will teach you all things. Talk to God. Don't just read your word. Talk to God. Ask the Holy Spirit to make it make sense to you, to show you how it applies to your life, you know? There's more to getting in the word of God than just saying, whoo I read three chapters today. Let's go. It's good that you're in the word of God, but drill down a little deeper. Drill down a little deeper. Talk to the Lord about it. Let God speak to you about it and, and see what God would have to say. So now let me wrap up real quickly tonight. 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, Peter wrote, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel, <coughs> but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The good news is one-third of you <laughs> is fixed, <laughs> is whole, is healthy. Your spirit, from the moment you were truly saved, is right is right it has been born again the spirit of the living god lives within you and your spirit is right first peter 1 and 23 you are born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth forever the rest of the story is two-thirds of us will rule our life if we'll let the soul and the body overrule the spirit we'll live a powerless joyless Christian life. We'll still make it to heaven, I believe, because our spirit has been saved, but we'll be powerless, we'll be joyless, we'll be miserable. But if we let our soul and our spirit work together to overrule the flesh, we'll take the limits off what God can do in our life. You know, it's like what Jesus said in, in John chapter number three. Jesus tells Nicodemus that a man must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus questions that and says he doesn't understand. And Jesus says something very important that I'm going to wrap up with tonight. He says, the flesh is the flesh, but the spirit is the spirit. The only thing, the only way for spiritual things to be produced through us is through the spirit. Because the flesh can only produce flesh. So I think the nutshell of this message tonight, I believe what God is trying to say to me and trying to say to you is this. We need to stop making things harder on ourselves than they need to be. What? Did you just say that in a holy, holiness-believing Pentecostal church? Yeah. No set of rules, no set of do's and don'ts is going to make your life better. Now, I didn't say that we don't need to have rules and limits, but what, I said, what I'm saying is this. Rules and limits are often set by us trying to conquer the flesh. Us trying to conquer the flesh. Don't do that. Don't taste that. Don't say that. Don't, 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 don't. My New Testament through Paul and through Peter tells me that if I truly want to have a spirit-filled, enjoyable, abundant life, I've got to let the Holy Ghost work on my mind. I've got to let the Holy Ghost that lives within my spirit work on my mind and do a transforming right here in my mind. Because before, those things that I tried to limit by saying, here's my list of ten things I do not do, instead they become ingrained on my heart. My want to gets changed, right? The Spirit produces a new way of thinking in my life. And I don't have to tell myself, don't lie, don't cheat people, don't be ugly. But instead, the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of me, and I don't want to lie to somebody. I don't want to cheat somebody. I don't want to be ugly. I don't want to be angry. And when those things poke through on a weekday, I feel convicted by it, and I go back and I try to make it right. I go back and apologize first to God and then to the person that I've offended, and I try to make it right. I can't tell you how many times uh, I have said to people, I'm sorry that I said that to you, or I'm sorry that I did that. I'm a Christian. I don't think a Christian ought to say that or do that. 
I was wrong. I've asked God to forgive me, and I wish you would too, or something like that. Why? Because my want to gets changed. I, I, wish, I, I wish I had a, 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 a recording of, of Brother Kohler from, from uh, I never can remember the name of that little town, where he, uh, where Swifton, Arkansas. Brother Kohler from Swifton, Arkansas, who would always say at our pastor's meetings, you know, I've been saved, whatever it was, 50-something, 60-something years. He was up in his 80s when I knew him. He said, and I still drink as much as I want to and smoke as much as I want to and run around with women as much as I want to, dance and party as much as I want to. He'd go on and on with whatever was on his mind, but then he'd say, the difference is my want to got changed. <laughs> You know what he's saying is, those things I used to want to do, by the power of God's Word working in me through the Holy Spirit, by me giving liberty and agreeing to work with the Lord, my want to has been changed. Amen? Amen. I find that when I don't read the Word of God, my want to gets diminished. But the more I read and the more that I study, the more I want to. When I don't pray, my want to says, I really don't want to pray. I'd rather watch TV or eat a bowl of Cheerios or <laughs> just about anything else. But when I do pray, when I do pray and I make it regular and systematic, I long for and I want that time of prayer, right? If you miss church long enough, you won't miss church. You know what I mean? Lay out of church and pretty soon the desire to be back at church is diminished in us. All of those things are what I'm talking about tonight. Let us rise up in this day and age and feed our spirit man. Y'all have all heard that old story about the Indian, the Native American belief that there were two wolves on the inside of, of somebody, you know, of a person, and they were light and dark, and they were fighting each other. And Well, which one wins? Well, the one that I feed, right? That's the way it is with the flesh and the spirit. Which one wins? The one that we feed the most.